In the spring of 2009, I tracked down the boy who had been my prom date and asked him to marry me. To be clear, I didn't want him to be my husband. In the 19 years since we had gone to the prom, he had been ordained as a member of the Jewish clergy, and I wanted him to perform the ceremony. I thought it'd be nice to have this little hint of my past at this occasion that was about my future. And I called him up and I pitched the idea, but I heard this hint of hesitation in his voice. But he agreed to meet with me, and so I got on the train. I was living in Manhattan at the time, and he was in the suburbs of New York. So I get on the train to meet him for lunch, and I'm thinking back on our prom and kind of what a fun night it had been, and it was this like crazy story that I had always remembered. But as I sat, reflected back on that story, I was like, oh, yeah, that explains the hesitation. It had been, I mean, I went to prom, it was, it, was, it was a group of six of us, three girls, three boys. It was the 90s, we were very heteronormative. The two girls were, were, very, were then and still are very good friends of mine, and, and the three boys were as follows. Boy number one was my crush, the one I had loved since the ninth grade. He was not my date, he was dating my friend. <laughs> Boy number two loved me. He had a big, big crush on me, and I should not have accepted his prom invitation because I didn't love him back, but I, I thought it'd be a really fun night, mostly because of boy number three, who was my best friend and would be my buffer from all the drama that would happen between boy number one and boy number two, and I was like, whatever happens, at least boy number three will be there, and, and we will laugh about it, and, and it'll, be a, it'll be fun. So we go to the prom, and afterwards we go to this hotel suite that someone had rented for an after party, and boy number one and his date disappear into one of the bedrooms. Boy number three, who several years later moves to San Francisco, comes out as gay, buys a shit ton of leather, and according to Facebook, spends a lot of time partying with fat, hairy gay men wearing leather who I who call themselves bears. <laughs> but in high school, he was clinging to that closet, and, and he and his date, to my great surprise, disappeared into one of the bedrooms, leaving me and my date in this hotel suite, which had a fireplace. It sounds really fancy, but it was this like kind of cheapish motel off the lodge in Southfield. Anyway. <laughs> He's sitting by the fireplace, and he's strumming his guitar, and he's singing this romantic song, and he's looking across the room at me, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a beautiful moment in somebody else's life. Like, (laughs) what am I doing here? And I turned and walked out the door, and went to another party of, of, of people from my prom that was downstairs, and I did something I had never done before. I got smashed. I pounded like it were screwdrivers, if memory serves correctly, because, you know, I was 17, and I'm pounding screwdrivers, and I stumble back to my room an hour later to discover that my prom date has written a heart-wrenching song about me and how I had stomped on his heart. And meanwhile, I had told this story over over the years as this like fun tale about the first time I got drunk. But sitting on the train, going out to meet this guy, to have lunch with him, it all comes flooding back. And it's like one of those posts that people put on Facebook or, 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 you know, Reddit, like, am I the asshole? And I'm thinking back like, no question, I am the asshole. This was a nice guy. He was my friend and a good person. And not only had I crushed his heart, but I had like laughed about it the next day with like boy number three, the future bear. (laughs) And then pretty much like glossed over that. And like 19 years later, I'm like, hey, you want to perform my wedding for me? (laughs) 
And so I'm on the train and I'm like, it's not the kind of request you can unask. Like, now what do I do? And I start worrying about it, like, oh my God, like, what if we go to this wedding ceremony and he seeks his revenge? What if he sings that song? (laughs) But you know, it had been 19 years, and you live, and you love, and you learn, and you have your heart broken, and you break hearts, and you hopefully, you, you try to learn from it, you try to grow, and if you're really lucky, Perhaps someday, on your wedding day, you can stand in a field of time beside some beautiful mountains in upstate New York, standing beside the man that you love and that you want to marry, in front of a very distinguished and respectable member of the Jewish clergy who went on to be very happily married, actually twice now, I think. Um, (laughs) And he will turn to your friends and your family and everybody you love in the world and smile broadly and say, how cool is this? I get to marry my prom date. <laughs> <laughs>